What's happening? What's What's happening? What's happening? What it do? What it do? What it do? And welcome to another edition of Swag Talk, the show where we cover the swag inside and out. I'm your host and tour guide around in this journey around the swag. My name is C. Wells, coming at you once again. And I'd like to wish all the Jags out there a happy homecoming and all the visitors who will be visiting the bluff this weekend. Happy homecoming. Enjoy your stay. Hopefully we have a good game. That game is our game of the week. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But before we get started, as usual, you can check out the socials down at the bottom of the screen. Um, if you want to make a donation to the show, you can hit the cash app, dollar sign, swag talk, um, and enjoy your stay. If you haven't done so already, once you uh, subscribe to the channel, uh, like the video, share them, comment, let me know who you think going to win this weekend. Uh, let me know who you think might ball out. Um, somebody who may be under the radar that you think might have a good game this weekend. Or just Give me your thoughts on the weekend's game, and, and we can chop it up in the comments as well. So no more further ado, man. This is week eight. We are in the middle of October. Um, I think I personally feel like from the, from October to November is separation Saturday almost every week, and that's no different here. Um, actually, you know, our, our game of the week is a separation Saturday game for Southern. Um, Southern has a hella hard – five games stretch to end the season so with them being um in second place right now in the division they can ill afford another loss so any every game they play from here on out if they win that next game is an elimination game so that um that pretty much sets the table for what this uh what this get what this season is gonna be like and what this week is gonna be like so we um are not gonna waste too much time we're gonna go ahead and jump directly into our preview on the first game we're going to talk about is Arkansas at UAPB at Arkansas. That's 11 o'clock kickoff in Little Rock at War Memorial Stadium. Game would be can be seen on the SEC network, and it also can be heard on the Pine Bluff uh, radio station. So this is um I'm I'm honestly man I'm not even going to talk about this game really at all because I I feel like um I don't have a I don't like Power five money games. Uh, the check is great. And, you know, this is an in state school. So that's, you know, a little bit of a, of a thing. It's like historical, like the first um, FCS opponent, a non a non conference Arkansas school that the Razorbacks have played. So that's, you know, that's something. And like I said, it's a, a, in Little Rock. So that's, that's something else. But, you know, the timing of this game could not be much worse. Um, if you're going to play this kind of game, I think it should be at the beginning of the season. Um, Pine Bluff is reeling, man. They've lost five in a row, four conference games in a row. And, um, you know, they lost to Central Arkansas at, in their second game of the season. So this team has looked progressively worse and worse and worse as the season goes on. Um, I don't know what his uh, contract situation is, but this could – this looks like it could be the end of the Doc Gamble experiment. Um, they probably, you know, give them another another year to kind of turn things around. But it's not looking good. Um, the quarterback play is shaky. They can't decide on a guy. They, they you know, they're bouncing guys back and forth. Um, the running game is non-existent. They have great receivers. They just aren't getting the ball. And last weekend, last weekend, the defense, you know, the run defense was just atrocious. Um Coach Gamble said they did good against the pass, so that was that was something. But um, the run game was just not just not, the run defense was just not there. Uh, getting gashed for over three hundred yards um, when you were allowing like one hundred and seventy five or so per game. So that was you know you're you're already reeling, and now you're going to play an SEC opponent. This um this is not going to be pretty. Um, the only thing I can say is Pine Bluff. I hope they cut you a nice check and um, get that check, get in and get out, and don't. Don't get no injuries, uh, so you can bounce back and bounce back to swag play um, the following week. So I'm not gonna, uh, like I say, man, I don't, I'm not even gonna break this game down because I, it it's not really worth worth that. And there's no offense to Pine Bluff, but uh, I've spent long enough on this game as is. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, put my score up here. I think Arkansas will win 63, 63 to six. Um, it's just you know Razorbacks can probably name this score. Uh, Pine Bluff, just, you know, get in, get out, and get yourself back ready for swag play. So 
that's going to do it for that game. Uh, the next game that we're going to talk about is a very interesting game. Um, it's, this is a game that I think um, can be a low-key game of the week, but not quite yet. Um, Texas Southern is hosting Alcorn. That game um, is a 7 o'clock kickoff. Um, can be seen on AT&T Sportsnet in the Houston area. So you can feel free to check that out. Um, Texas Southern, you know, they, they're playing some good offensive ball. Uh, Andrew Body, uh, the young freshman quarterback, is, is playing, you know, he's playing well in spurts. Didn't have the greatest of games against Grambling. Grambling's defense is pretty pretty strong for the, the team that they have. So he struggled a little bit in that game. Um, turnovers kind of did him in. And he just didn't really get get the production that he, he would normally get in the, uh, his previous two games. So he's facing the Alcorn team that's getting better week by week. They're not winning pretty, but they're winning. And that's, you know, that's championship caliber football is to win games any way you can and, and not to fold, not to give up, and just to play hard uh, game in and game out. Texas Southern is, four, I mean, Alcorn is 4-2 on the season. 3-0 and right now. They're a half game behind Prairie View even though they're tied in the standings um, since both are undefeated, but right now they're a half game back. So they need this win to keep pace with Prairie View, and they have a big game with Prairie View coming up later in the season. So, that you know, this is a very important game. Um, Alcorn cannot afford to slack. Texas Southern is dangerous on offense, and they can be a problem on offense if you're not, if you're not, um, if you're not consistent with the way that you play. Um, defensively, Texas Southern is not not really good, so we'll get into their numbers and everything in a minute. But Alcorn comes in averaging 22 and a half points per game. They're allowing 21 points per game. They are running for an uh, average of 150 yards per game. Their running game is getting better week by week, so that's that's going to be a problem for Texas Southern, who um, has had problems stopping the run this season. Uh, Alcorn is allowing 138 yards per game rushing. The Braves are averaging 214 yards per game passing, uh, nine touchdowns, three interceptions, 95 of 163. Uh, their opponents are averaging 182 yards per game passing, and they have four touchdowns and three interceptions, 99 of 176. So it's, you know, the Braves defense is getting better. Uh, like I said, week by week, they're getting better. Uh, that North Carolina Central game is appearing further and further in the rearview mirror. And this team is starting to turn that corner. They're not quite there yet, but they're starting to turn the corner. And they're starting to play some good football, um, winning football especially. Uh, at points, uh, average yards per game, all corn 364 per game. They average 5.4 yards per play. The opponents 320 yards per game, and they average 5 yards per play. So defensively, like I said, they're just getting better. Offense is starting to find that consistency. The pass game, you know, with Felix Harper and his receivers is going to be the but that running game with Nico Duffy and Stafford Anderson is, is getting better week week by week. Uh, third down conversions, all corn 31.8% third down conversion and 52% on fourth downs. Our opponents are converting 32% on third down and 21% on fourth down. So they're doing a better job week, week in and week out of getting stops, and that's helping them a lot. All corn has fumbled the ball six times on the season and lost two. The opponents have fumbled 13 times and lost 10, so you definitely have to be careful when you play all coin because one way or the other, they're forcing fumbles. Uh, they just have some tremendous fumble luck going on, and they're able to recover those fumbles. So they're, they're doing a good job of turning over the opponent. They have 13 turnovers on the season, forced, and uh, they have five giveaways, so that's a plus 12 turnover margin, and you can, you're going to win a lot of games with that. Uh, Alcorn has seven sacks, which is kind of not Alcorn-like. Uh, they're allowing with 20 sacks, which is also not quite Alcorn-like. But, you know, they, they've been they've been having some struggles with both lines. And the last couple games, they played a bit better game, you know, week by week. Uh, Nico Duffy is the leader in Russia on the team. He has 564 yards and three touchdowns, averaging 5.6 yards per carry. Uh, Stafford Anderson, three, 204 yards on the season. Uh, no touchdowns yet, but 5.2 yards per carry. And Felix Harper right now is running for 86 yards. And he's a guy who, you know, he's not going to really just go out and kill you with his legs, but he can extend plays. And if he get loose, then he's going to be trouble. 
Um, your your biggest issue is keeping him from getting getting scrambling and getting those receivers open. Uh, like I said, Harper is one ninety five or one sixty three, uh, fifty eight percent on fifty eight percent completion rate. You know, you like to see that number go up a bit. Uh, nine touchdowns, three interceptions, twelve hundred and eighty six yards on the season. Leading receiver is the Charles Pringle, twenty eight catches, four hundred and five yards and five touchdowns. He's averaging fourteen point six yards per catch. C.J. Bowler, 16 catches, 358 yards. He's averaging 22.3 yards per catch, and he has one touchdown. Juan Anthony, 15 catches, 195 yards, and a touchdown. Uh, Manny Jones, six catches, 413 yards, uh, 18 yards per catch for him. So those guys are the guys that you need to really look out for. Um, they're going to get the ball. If Felix Harper has time, he's going to get the ball. He's going to spread it around, and those guys can – they can, you know, they can beat you any kind of way. They can beat you with routes, or they can beat you um, out out in open space. So those receivers are very dangerous, and like I said, those backs are dangerous. And this offense is not really clicking on full cylinder yet, but they've shown flashes, and that's, you know, that's dangerous. Ron Kinsler leads the defense with twenty-one uh, with thirty-eight tackles. Uh, Te- Dewan Taylor thirty-eight as well. Cherilis thirty-five. Solomon Wise twenty-eight. Uh, Heron, 26, tackles for loss, uh, leader right now is Cherilis with seven and a half tackles for loss, followed by Wren with uh, three, and a, three and a half tackles for loss, and uh, Kinsler with three tackles for loss. The leading sack man on the season right now is um, they have uh, five guys with one sack apiece, and then two guys, and then uh, two guys with half a sack. So, like I said, they only have seven sacks right now, but they can, you know, they can amp that up and get some pressure on your, on your quarterback. Uh, interceptions, four, uh, five guys each have an interception. So, they, um, they're they they're making plays on the ball, but all, this is not your typical all-corn defense. So, they they are more than capable, but they're still kind of putting things together. Uh, Texas Southern comes into the game at two and four, one and two. On, in the SWAC, uh, they're averaging 22.6 points per game, and they're allowing 43.8. They are running for 142 yards per game and four yards per carry. Defensively, they're allowing 260 per game on the ground and 5.9 yards per carry. So that's a problem against a team like Alcorn, who has two running backs that are going to be more than capable of carrying the ball. And I would not I would not be surprised if Alcorn leaned on their run game m- more early especially to open up the pass game. So that's going to be a problem for Texas Southern is to get stopped and, and, and try to get some negative plays on defense and put all coin behind the chains because if they're picking up five, six yards every time they run the ball, um, you're putting yourself in, in a bad position as a defense. So I, I don't expect Texas Southern to have much success if they can't hold all coin to some, some, short, some short runs. They don't all necessarily have to be tackled for loss but you need to get them in long down and distance, and that way you can force the action yourself. Uh, passing, Texas Southern, 248 yards per game. They have three touchdowns on the season and three interceptions, uh, 104 of 174. The opponents are 100 of 150 with seven touchdowns and six interceptions, averaging 259 yards per game passing giving the opponents a total offense of 519 yards per game and a 7.0 yard per play average. The Tigers, 390 per game and a 5.5 yard per game average. So, the, like I said, the defense is going to be probably the biggest sticking point for Texas Southern in this game, and that's going to be the thing that kind of holds them back. Now, obviously, they have a great young quarterback who we're going to talk about in a minute. So um, we're, we'll get to that really, really quick. Uh, third down conversions, Texas Southern 32% on the season. Opponents uh, are having a 41% completion rate. So, like I said, defense, again, needs to get stopped. Uh, opponents are 8 of 10 on fourth downs for 80%. They're just not getting off the field one way or the other. Uh, Texas Southern is 35% fourth down completion rate, 5 of 14. They have seven fumbles on the season. The opponents have six. Given the Tigers are uh, 10 turnovers. To the opponent, 12 turnovers, so they are plus two right now. Uh, Sacks, Texas Southern has seven, and the 
opponents have 11. So neither one of these teams really is ranked high in, in sacks. But that just, you know, get, getting sacks is not the end-all, be-all to your defense. Um, if you can still get pressure on the quarterback, knock him down, you know, hurry him, you know, that that's that can be just as good as a sack because that can lead to negative plays. So, you know, that's one of the things to keep an eye out on, on for both of these teams is who can get to the quarterback and disrupt him and disrupt the offense, the flow. Uh, right now, Andrew Body leads the team in rushing with 269 yards, 5.5 yards per carry and two touchdowns. He is only a freshman. Um, he's going to get better as, as, he, as he gets more experience. Um, this is this is just a start for him. Um, I think he's going to be a great quarterback in, in the future. He's going to have some growing pains right now, but the foundation is there. And right now, like I said, he's getting it done with his legs and his arm. Uh, Ja'Cory Howard is the leader running back with 139 yards on the season, 5.1 yards per carry and three touchdowns. Kevin Harris, 133 yards, 3.5 yards per carry and two touchdowns. Body, obviously leading passer right now, 68 of 106, 64% completion rate, uh, one touchdown, three interceptions, and he has 887 yards. And he has some guys who can make some plays at receiver, Keelan Davis, uh, leads the team with 27 receptions for 466 yards, 17.2 yards per catch average. Excuse me, Jaron Johnson, 22 catches, 268 yards, 11.9 yards per catch, and two touchdowns. Jonathan Giles, 23 catches, 163 yards, and he has seven yard per catch average and one touchdown. So as you can see, the second, the, the fourth guy on the team in receptions has five. So these are the three guys that they trust to get the ball to. Um, for a young quarterback, those guys are like the security blanket. So all corn needs to know where these guys are at all times because they they aren't really gonna go to very many other people. They do have a lot of people on on the statistical sheet with you know one or two catches, but the guys that they're gonna lean on more often than not are those top three guys. So those are the guys that really have to keep keep occupied and know where they at at all times. And you want to confuse the young the young quarterback and, and make him have some tough uh, adjustments and reads to make, and that way your defense can help the offense out. Uh, Matthew Williams leads Texas Southern with twenty four uh, with thirty eight tackles on the season. Tariq Cooper twenty seven, Julian Marcantel twenty five, and Tyler Martinez with twenty two tackles for loss. Cooper three and a half, Martinez two and a half. Martinez leads the team in sacks with two. And interceptions, they have uh, seven guys. Uh, they have um, four guys. Each have one interception apiece. So again, nobody really is just out and out being a total ball hawk. They're opportunistic, and they've made some big turnovers um, throughout the course of the season. So who do I think is going to win this game? Um, I'm going Alcorn because number one, I think Alcorn's the better team right now. Uh, Texas Southern has a bright future, but right now I think Alcorn is the better team. And teams are aware of what Texas Southern can do now because they beat Southern. Um, nobody's going to sleep on them right now. And this is a trap game for Alcorn, not necessarily um, because of a game coming up later in the se- and later in the week, but more so because this is a team that you can sleep on. Um, you know, these two teams don't play each other too often, not their West Division opponents. And Texas Southern – Tended, tend, tended to play Alcorn tough whenever they did play. So I think this is going to be a, a tough game for Alcorn. I think they'll pull away late. Uh, the running game, again, will be the key. And those receivers will, uh, will get loose. And the trigger man will do his thing. Uh, the defense will be able to get a couple stops and seal a game for them. So I like Alcorn in this game by a score of 34 to 17. Things will be close for at, at least three quarters or so. And I think Alcorn will pull away to get the victory. So, again, I like the Braves in this one. I think they have a good chance of, of winning. And they have – this is a very important game for them low-key because they have some big games on the horizon um, with Southern coming up next week and Prairie View coming up in a couple of weeks. So, you know, you don't want to get caught scoreboard watching because this is a night game. So, you know, you're going to know, you know, at, by the, well, Southern and Prairie View will be playing when this game is going on. So you don't want to get caught up in who's doing what. Um, because that's a surefire way to lose. So um, this is a, a an important game for FAMU, and like I said, I mean, excuse me, for Alcorn, and it's a um, low-key, uh, a tough game. So I think the Braves will be up to the task, 
and they'll take their business in this one. So that takes us to our next game on the on the schedule, and that will be Florida A and M heading to the Delta to take on the Delta Devils of Mississippi Valley. That's a three o'clock kickoff. Uh, Rattler Sports Network radio broadcast. I believe Valley has a YouTube. Um, broadcast as well, so you might want to check that out. Um, so if you want to watch the game, you can probably, I think you can watch it on the Valley, uh, on the Valley YouTube channel. Um, I'll, I'll throw the link in the description, um, just in case, but um, that's that's somewhere that you can probably check it out if they if they air it. Otherwise, catch it on the Family Radio Network. This, you know, this game is a, is a, is gonna be a, a, a good game, you know, and that that sounds funny, um, saying that, um, you know, like a, 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 a Fam U Valley game is gonna be a good game, but Valley's playing some good football right now, and I really um they lost, you know, they lost um last week to Alcorn, but they were in that game. They just couldn't really get any offensive consistency or anything really going offensively on the scoreboard. But Valley's a tough team, and they're tough at home. You know, they they really uh um are, are tough out at home. They they play really aggressive and physical, and and they're gonna. They're gonna challenge FAMU's the offense with that Valley defense. That they, they play fast. You know, they they like to get in the backfield, and um, you you really just need to wear them down over time to to be successful. Um, offensively, it's gonna be a different challenge because FAMU's defense is top two in the league right now. Um, they're gonna cause Valley a lot of problems. Um, in the in the in the Offensive game as a whole, uh, Jelani Easton is going to be very important in this game. Uh, he's going to have to pass better. Uh, he didn't have a great game at all against Alcorn, so that's going to be a guy who definitely is going to have to step up. Um, Caleb Johnson, like I, like I said, week in and week out, if he played for any other school in this conference, everybody would know who he is. Um, he's a really good back. I, I, I had a chance to witness him with my own eyes, and he's a good one. And, you know, so that's a guy that, that found you going to key on, and they're going to make it tough for him. And uh, Easton's going to have to help uh, carry the load with his team and get the passing game going. So, uh, you know, fam, you, you know, they're still, you know, they still have a glimmer um, of hope in the division, but they're going to need Jackson State to lose two games for that to, to come to fruition. But there's been a lot of talk lately about fam, you, and the playoffs. So, you know, you cannot – you know, you cannot play a game like this close. You really need to take care of business in a game like this. Um, they've been getting better week in and week out. Uh, the defense has played extremely well um, pretty much all season. They've played well, and they've, they've caused a lot of problems for teams as, as the season has gone on. And like I said, their, um, the offense is starting to find find their way, and they, they – um, are really starting to get it done. Uh, Rashawn McKay is playing better. Uh, he still, you know, is making some mistakes, but he's a quarterback that's going to, you know, more often than not, he's not going to hurt you. Um, his job is really to manage the game. Um, Bishop Barnett and the run game is definitely where it's at right now. Um, they're running the ball extremely well. Uh, Barnett had a huge game against um, Alabama and m although that's not saying a lot because, the Bulldogs defense is not playing that well, but they did play pretty solid um, against FAMU on Saturday in uh, for the first three quarters of the game before they folded up in the fourth. But FAMU comes into this game averaging 25 points per game, and they're allowing 15. Again, defense, like I said, top two defense in scoring defense. They, they are really tough to score on. Uh, they're tough to run on. They're allowing 101 yards per game rushing. and um. That's going to be tough for Valley because Valley loves to run the football. Uh, FAMU is averaging 166 yards per game rushing, and that's a really big change from 2019 when they had Ryan Stanley and the running game was more of just a decoy and the passing game was where it was. So 166 yards rushing on the season for, for FAMU. They're averaging five yards per carry. They're allowing 3.1 yards per carry. Passing right now, like I said, still a work in progress. 202 yards per game passing, uh, 121 of 213, eight touchdowns, three interceptions. The opponents, 161 yards per game passing, 85 of 177, three touchdowns and seven interceptions. Total offense, 368 yards for the Rattlers, 
giving them a 5.4 yard per play average. The opponents 262 on the uh, total offense, 4.2 yard per game average. Third down conversions, fam, you 31%. That number really still needs to improve. Uh, the opponents 25% third down. The going is tough against this defense. I, I mean, I don't know how many times I got to say that. I don't know how many ways I can say that, but this defense is very good and they're really aggressive and they they do a good job of getting stops um, to get the ball back to the offense. Uh, 21 sacks on the season for FAMU. They're allowing nine. They have four fumbles on the season and the opponents have seven. Individually, Bishop Barnett is the leading rusher. Uh, 500 yards, 7.1 yard per carry average, and four touchdowns. Terrell Jennings is a uh, is the second guy, 307 yards on the season, 5.3 yards per carry, and four touchdowns. McKay obviously is the quarterback. You know they they kind of meddled in early in the season trying to figure out, but they they decided to go with McKay, and uh, he's 102 or 176 on the season, 57 percent completion rate. You'd like to see that get better. Um, especially if he's going to manage this offense, then he needs to have a better completion percentage. Um, seven touchdowns and only one interception. So he's not turning the ball over. He's doing what you ask, but he's not really flashy. So it, it's kind of, you know, it kind of looks bad because he's not putting up crazy numbers. And they have a really good receiving core. So that kind of, you know, makes it even, makes it look even crazier that they're not putting up better passing numbers. Uh, Xavier Smith, 33 catches. 292 yards and one touchdown. David Manigo, 21 catches, 236 yards. He's averaging 11.2 yards per catch. Uh, Jamar, Jamari Sherrod, 25 catches, 187 yards and two touchdowns. And Chad Hunter, 14 catches, 116, 161 yards, uh, tw- um, 11.5 yards per catch average and one crazy touchdown. Um, that he caught against FAMU, I mean, against Alabama and him. So that's um that's his one touchdown that he made it count. Kamari Young um, doesn't have a lot of catches, only five, but he has three touchdowns and he's averaging 24 yards per catch. So that's a guy to look out for. If, you know, he's going to go deep and he can get in the end zone. So that's a guy to definitely look out for. Marquise Bell leads the defense with uh, 41 tackles on the season. Uh, Fagan, 28. Isaiah Land, who is their big time sack guy, he has 25 tackles. Collier, 23. Uh, Mayweather, 22. And BJ Bowler with 21. Uh, Land leads the team with 12 and a half tackles for loss. Deontay Williams, six. Land has 10 sacks on the season. And uh, Williams has four. Leading man interception, Bowler and Morgan each have two apiece. So if you're valid, you obviously you know that you need to know where. Isaiah Land is at all times because he's going to be a problem for your offense. Um, Valley's offensive line is not the best, and their passing game obviously is not is not the most consistent. They can't really – they don't really try to go deep. So they like to spread you out in a lot of receiver screens and stuff like that. And fam, you're going to have a field day with that kind of stuff. So it's going to be – like I said, it's going to be important for Valley to try to hit as many passes as they can and to keep their running game going because if they – fall behind, then it's going to be tough to move the ball against this FAMU defense. And um, like I said, Valley, they just have to kind of do what they do. Uh, if they're going to have any shot, um, they had a two-game winning streak that was ended against Alcorn at uh, a two and four, one and two on the season. They have to find some kind of way to get some production through their passing offense. Right now, they're averaging 124 yards passing uh, they have five touchdowns and six interceptions. They're 86 of 152. Rushing, they are averaging 141 yards per game, which is really good for Valley because Valley has struggled to run the ball in recent years, uh, 3.7 yards per carry. They are averaging 14 and a half points per game. So they, they still aren't really scoring a lot of points, but they're keeping themselves in game. They're allowing 30 points per game, and they are allowing 176 yards on the ground which kind of plays into what FAMU does right now and 236 through the air. So they're not, you know, they can be hit for big plays and they've given up some big yardage through the air to most teams that they play. Uh, they have, have allowed 10, uh, 11 touchdowns and three interceptions. The opponents are 91, 94 of 161 passing on the season. 
Valley is converting 30% third down. So that, you know, that goes a long way in why their games are going the way that they're going. Uh, they have two fumbles on the season and they have 14 sacks. The opponents, 37, uh, 40% completion rate. And they um, have a 36% rate on third, on fourth down. So defensively, they're playing well on fourth downs. Um, they haven't recovered a fumble yet, and they've allowed 16 sacks on the season. Individually, like I said, Caleb Johnson is the leading rusher. He has 526 yards and four and a half yards per carry with four touchdowns. Um, to run the ball like he does, knowing with everybody in the stadium, knowing that he's basically the only guy that can run. I mean, Eason can run, but he's not consistent. So we, uh, Johnson is the guy that everybody knows is going to get the ball, and he still carries the ball really well. He's going to probably be an all sweat guy at the end of the season. Uh, Eason, 65 of 107 passing, 60% uh, completion rate, 591 yards, five touchdowns and three interceptions. Re receivers, these guys have to make some plays. Uh, Jerry is Clayton, 22 catches on the season, 199 yards, one touchdown. Ja'Cory Rankin, 19 catches, 186 yards, and one touchdown. Malik Myers, 11 catches, 108 yards, uh, no touchdowns. Donald Johnson, nine catches, 78 yards, and one touchdown. All of their receivers are averaging between 8.6 yards per catch and 9.7 yards, 9.8 yards per catch. They don't, like I said, they don't throw down the field, man. They they love to throw a lot of screens. Um, they screen game you to death. And, you know, that can, you know, that can catch an aggressive defense, but fam, you is tough to move the ball on. They're going to have to take a shot somewhere um, to open this defense up because they're going to feast on, on, on them if they don't. Romy Swanier is the leading tackler with 33. Jeremiah Crane, 29. Deion Reed, 29. Jalen Bell, 28. Uh, Jiren Fox, 25. Tackles for loss. Swanier leads the team with eight. Thomas, five and a half. Bell, five. Reed, four. Thomas leads the team in sacks with four and Bell with two. And interceptions, they have. Um, Three, uh, three guys with uh, interception apiece. So, like I said, Valley hasn't really forced a lot of turnovers yet. And defensively, they they are aggressive. Sometimes a little bit too aggressive, and that can hurt you um, in in a game. Um, if you get caught trying to always fire in the backfield and make plays, you can get exposed like that. But this um this should be an entertaining game. This is another game I think is going to be close for a while, and then it'll um. It'll, it'll start to go the, the way of the better team. And that better team, obviously, is FAMU. And I'm going to go with the Rattlers in this one by a score of 31 to 13. Um, I think Valley is going to be game. I think they're going to play. Um, they're going to play tough, as usual, at home. Um, but I think FAMU's defense will set up their offense for quite a few scores. And offense just won't hurt them. They're going to do what they need to do. And, and, and get through and, and not hurt themselves. So uh, that leads us to our next game, which is Bethune-Cookman at Jackson State. Uh, Bethune-Cookman is a team, like I said, man, they they have not played. They've played – I don't want to say they play good or bad, but they have not obviously won a game this year. Um, they're going to have a coaching issue at the end of the season, I believe. Uh, Coach Sims is definitely a guy that's going to have to be looking over his shoulder. Um, they have a way of staying in game. They don't. They don't really get blown out, but they still lose. You know, they 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 can fight and and claw and keep themselves in games, but they make a mistake here and there to keep themselves from winning. Um, are they? You know, are they just score a few points to make the score look better than what it was before? But they just have not played a game good enough to win. They played a couple games I thought they could have won, but they just are reeling right now, and they're 0-7 in the, in, on the season, 0-4 in conference. And they have a very tough task ahead of them this week. Um, they are averaging 128 yards per game and 24 points per game, 128 yards on the ground, 5 yards per carry. The opponents are averaging 200 yards on the ground. That's a big problem, uh, 4.9 yards per carry. Uh, passing, they've been juggling quarterbacks. They're another team that's been juggling quarterbacks. 
239 through the air, 11 touchdowns, nine interceptions on the season. Uh, 129 of 239 passing. The opponents, 262 through the air per game, 15 touchdowns, three interceptions, 141 of 221. So they allow a lot of big plays through the air and scores. Third down conversion, uh, Bethune-Cookman, 32%. The opponents, 42%. Uh, they have six fumbles on the season and 11 sacks. They've allowed 13 sacks, and they've recovered six fumbles. The opponents are converting 47% third down rate. So that's definitely a problem. Um, against an offense like Jackson State, that's going to cost you some serious points in this game. Uh, Quayshawn Bird leads the team with 476 yards rushing and four touchdowns, 6.6 yards per carry. Devin Black's come on strong. Um, he's been relieving Shannon Patrick at quarterback, uh, 289, 259 yards rushing, 11.3 yards per carry, and one touchdown. Um, Patrick is still the leading passer right now, but Black's been playing more in, in relief for him. Um, neither guy's really lighting it up. They're both about 50% completion rate. Um, Patrick, 965 yards, Black, 663. Uh, six touchdowns for Patrick, five for Black. To Patrick's problem is interceptions. He has six on the season. Black has two. Receiving, there's one name you need to know, and that's Kamari Averett. That dude is a big-time player, um, probably the best tight end in the league right now. Um, he has 35 catches for 657 yards. He's averaging 18.7 yards per catch and six touchdowns. Nobody else has more than uh, 15 catches. So um, he's leading the team by a far margin in catches and yards. Uh, the highest yardage uh, behind him is 214, and nobody has multiple touchdowns. So he's the guy that they um, that they look for, and he's going to be a problem for Jackson State uh, safeties and linebackers um, if the, whoever the quarterback is has some time to throw because we know that this Jackson State defense is just going to murderize the offensive line and cause a lot of problems. Ontario Johnson is the leading tackler for the Wildcats. Uh, 56 tackles on the season to Keevan Thomas, 53. Uh, Thomas leads the team with seven and a half tackles for loss, followed by uh, Hall with four and a half sacks. Thomas leads with two, followed by Sutherland with one and a half uh, interceptions. They have three guys with one apiece. And they're facing, obviously, a team that everybody knows and loves, uh, Jackson State. The Tigers um, are playing the type of football that you were at the beginning of the season. You were nervous of if you are not a Jackson State fan. You were nervous of how this team would play, and the defense. You know it speaks for itself, man. They they don't allow anything. It, it, you you can't really run much. You can't really throw much. Um, they do have some holes in that defense, but are you gonna be able to withstand their their blitzing to make a play? That's 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 the key to this game. You know they're gonna they're gonna do what they do on defense. They're gonna get after your quarterback and they're gonna make it hard for you to, to do anything. They're allowing 77 yards on the ground, uh, 2.3 yards per rush, 162 yards through the air, 100 of 199, three touchdowns. They don't uh, five touchdowns. They don't have any interceptions yet, but the sacks that they get force a lot of punts. So that's almost as good as a turnover. Offensively, the running games gotten better the last two weeks. Uh, Santi Marshall has been the starter the last two weeks. Um, they're up to 100 yards per game rushing, uh, 3.4 yards per carry. Those numbers still can be better, but they are improving in the run game. Uh, J.D. Martin is also a back that's looking really good. Um, passing, obviously, Shadour is doing his job as a, as a young quarterback, 257 yards per game passing. He only has one, in, one interception on the season, 13 touchdowns, 135 of 199. Total offense, Jackson State, 357 yards per game, 5.7 yards per play. The opponents, 240 on the season, 3.6 yards per play. Uh, third down conversions, Jackson State, 40%. That number's gone up as the season went on. Um, T.C. Taylor's done a good job these last two games running that offense. They're 16% on fourth down, one or six, but, you know, that's not really a make-or-break stat for them right now. 29% uh, third down rate for the opponents. You just can't move the ball on this defense. 27% uh, on fourth down. Uh, they have 27 sacks on the season. 
and they have uh, recovered six fumbles. The opponents do have 15 sacks, and they've recovered eight fumbles. So you can, you know, you can still get pressure on this team. Uh, the deep offensive line still is not that great, but they've done a couple things to mask it the last couple of weeks um, in the run game. Like I said, Santee Marshall leads the team with 305 yards. Uh, 4.8 yards per carry, three touchdowns. Tadura is the guy. Um, he he's accurate as hell. Um, 69% completion rate right now, and that's great as a freshman. 1,543 yards, 13 touchdowns, one interception. Receiving, they have a lot of guys who can hurt you. I keep Corbin's come on strong the last few weeks. 27 catches, 421 yards, four touchdowns. Warren Newman, guy that can hurt you out of the slot and in the return game. 37 catches, 295, two touchdowns. Rucker, um, a big play guy, 14 catches, 249, a touchdown. Josh Lanier, 23 catches, 207, and three touchdowns. Malachi Whiteman, that's a name to listen out for. Young kid, um, committed to Florida State, uh, decommitted, went to Tennessee, hit the portal. Hell of an athlete, man. If y'all don't know, hopefully he'll get a chance to play basketball at Jackson State because he's a hell of a basketball player, too. Um, he's come on strong the last couple of weeks with uh, uh, eight catches for 108 yards and two touchdowns after 13 and a half yards per catch. Aubrey Miller leads the defense with uh, 62 tackles, Hampton 37, James Houston 30, Houston 11 and a half tackles for loss, Miller eight and a half, uh, Hampton seven, uh, Antoine Owens seven and a half tackles for loss, Houston eight and a half sacks, Miller five. So, you know, like I said, it's just you, you just hey man, that defensive line is gonna cause trouble. The linebackers are gonna get after you. If you're gonna have any success against this against this defense, you have to try to find a way to keep your quarterback upright, number one. And number two, you have to try to take advantage of those safeties and uh get those linebackers out in coverage to some kind of degree because they uh other than Hampton, they kind of struggle at that. At that coverage, uh, at that position, covering guys out the backfield. So this game is going to be a one-sided game. Um, typical Jackson State game this year. Um, 34-14 is the score that I'm going with. Um, I think the Tigers will take care of business in this one. I think they um, are going to continue to march, and they're going to be a problem for everybody that they face um, as the season progresses. So. That leads us to our final game of the week, and that is our game of the week, and that's Southern against against Prairie View. Um, for Southern, this game is an elimination game. Every week is an elimination game for them. Um, they can ill afford any more losses with two with the two teams ahead of them that are undefeated. They cannot afford another loss, or they would drop out of the race. Um, Prairie View, they're playing probably the best football that they played in quite a while um, as a as a whole team. Um, offensively, Prairie View's been strong the last uh, in 2019, 2018. You know, they had some really explosive offenses. Uh, the spring offense was missing a lot of pieces, and they just weren't that good. But the defense has been really good. Um, they did have a, a, a rough outing against Bethune Cookman on the ground, but they've been pretty stout. Um, they're allowing 95 yards per game rushing, so. They are tough to run against, and they're going to be tested in this game by Southern's run game. Uh, they're, a lot, they're averaging 184 yards per game rushing, 4.2 yards per carry, passing 263 per game, um, eight touchdowns, six interceptions, 97 to 160. The opponents, 171 through the air, eight touchdowns, four interceptions, 84 of 183. Total offense, uh, Prairie View 447 per game, 5.9 yards per play. The opponents 266 per game and four yards per play. Third down conversion rate, Prairie View 37%. The opponents uh, 28. So, like I said, this defense is, you know, is quietly um, a top three defense. Um, they did have some, like I said, they did have some problems against Bethune Cookman with the run game, but they've done a really good job of, of, of stopping the run in other games. They have 13 sacks. Uh, they fumbled four times. They lost four fumbles on the season. Uh, the opponents have lost two, and the opponents have seven sacks. The offense, like I said, this is almost looking like those Jalen Morton, the Wanye Tucker type of offenses that they can hurt you through the air and on the ground. 
um, a, a really, you know, speedy back and a nice big quarterback that can run. That's pretty much that offense from 18 and 19. And that's what this is now. Uh, Brooks, and Damian Brooks, Gremlin transfer has really played well for Prairie View, 244 on the season, rushing 6.3 yards per carry, two touchdowns. Jawan Pass, the Louisville transfer, Puma, as his nickname is, 199, um, 4.2 yards per carry, and two touchdowns. Kristen Mosley, 192 yards, 4.7 yards per carry, and Jaden Stewart, 187 yards uh, and two touchdowns. So they have four guys that they trust to run the ball. Um, also, Amar Antoine is another guy who can carry the ball for them. Uh, pass is the leading passer right now, 95 of 154, 61% completion rate, 1,281 yards, eight touchdowns and five interceptions. Antonio Mullins is their possession guy, 24 catches, 318 yards, two touchdowns. Jalen Howard, big play guy, 25.5 yards per catch average, 11 touchdowns, 281 yards, three touchdowns. And Kobe Washington, 11 catches, 151 yards, and one touchdown. Defensively, they are very aggressive. Um, they um, really get after you. Drake Cheatham, 34 tackles to lead the team. Trayshawn Smith, 31. Darius Campbell and Bryce Turner, 23. Jesse Evans, 22. And Shahid Reese, 20. Tackles for loss. Doom, Jason Dumas, uh, six tackles for loss. He's a beast on that defensive line. I've been saying that for a long time. Uh, he's a Louisiana guy, so I know he's going to want a ball out in this game. Uh, Darius Campbell, five and a half tackles for loss. And Rashad Powell, five and a half tackles for loss. Dumas being a sack man, three and a half. And um, interceptions, Logan Jackson has two interceptions to lead the Panthers. And they're facing a Southern team who is, honestly, I, I don't know what to say about this team. Um, they played up and down. Uh, the Texas Southern game, the offense played extremely well. The defense did not play well. They allowed a lot of yardage and points. And then they turn around against uh, UAPB and only allow 200 yards uh, a total offense of seven points, which came at the end of the game. Uh, the running game for Southern is obviously where it's at. They're going to run the football. That's just what they do. But you're going to have to be prepared for that back-to-back 300-yard -back rushing games uh, the last two weeks. So that's that's what Prairie View, Prairie View knows what Southern wants to do. So they, they're going to have to uh, adjust accordingly for that. Um, Kobe Dillon has come on strong for Southern at, at running back. Uh, he's the reigning SWAC Offensive Player of the Week. He had 268 yards against against Pine Bluff and three touchdowns, 19 yards per carry on the, on the game. So this team comes in here um, looking to make a statement. Um, a lot of people have counted Southern out already. I don't think Southern's out of this by any stretch, but they're going to have to fight and claw and scratch, and their defense is going to have to show improvement um, every week if they want to stay in the hunt for, for the championship, uh, the West Division championship. And obviously, like I said, that starts right now. Um, Southern's going to, like I said, Southern's going to throw a bunch of guys at you on the ground. Um, Devon Ben's going to carry the ball. Um, Craig Nelson. Uh, they're expecting Gerard Sims may be back this week. So um, that's another guy that you can look forward to seeing carry the ball. And obviously, Kobe Dillon running the ball. Uh, Ladarius Skelton got some carries in the in the um, Palm Bluff game. So expect him to get worked into the mix um, for that. The passing game is, you know, it is what it is. Uh, they threw the ball for about – they threw the ball for like 70 yards against Palm Bluff, but that's because they really ran it well. Um, Bubba McDaniel is the starting quarterback. He's playing, you know, he's playing well. He's running the offense well. He doesn't really make a lot of mistakes. Um, obviously, he's not the runner that Skelton is, but he's a guy that can actually get the ball down the field better, which helps receivers like Marquise McClain and Jamal Washington to to really make some plays. Uh, Tyler Kirkwood is another guy to look out for a receiver. Chandler Whitfield as well. Uh, Travis O'Connor who is a prayer view transfer, so I expect him to get some, some burn in this game. And that doesn't even count the receipt, the uh, tight ends. Ethan Howard um, is the best tight end on Southern's team, top two tight end in the league. Uh, Gregory Perkins and Travis Tucker also can catch the ball downfield. Expect a lot of play action from Southern when they do throw the ball. Um, expect to see, like I said, lots of guys run the ball. 
You can throw Washington and McLean in the in their running game mix as well. Uh, defensively, uh, Ray Anderson is basically the leader of this team at linebacker. Um, John Lewis has been banged up off and on all season, so he hasn't really got the production that a lot of people expected from him. But they've stepped up some guys on the defensive line. Um, Cameron Peterson has been big in the middle of the defense. Um, Jordan Woods, who is a four-star transfer from Georgia Tech by way of FIU, uh, he got his first action on Saturday against Pine Bluff, and he definitely took care of business in that in that game, clogging up the middle. So that, those are a couple of guys. Jalen Ivey is still a big guy on the defensive line. Lyston Barber is a, a younger guy that you can look out for um, to play in. He's going to make some make some plays as well. Uh, the secondary has been, you know, they've been up and down all year, but they've been banged up, and they have some guys who can make some plays as well. Chase Foster three interceptions on the, in the Pine Bluff game. So this game I'm really ex- excited to be at. I mean, obviously it's homecoming, and, you know, that, that amps up the atmosphere. But this is a huge game. Um, I know they already said that the west side of the stadium is already sold out, and uh, tickets are going rapidly for this game. So if you haven't got your tickets yet, man, you need to hurry up because the yard is going to be crazy. Um, I advise anybody who hasn't been to a Southern game, if you're coming down on Saturday, Please get on campus early. Um, the crowd is going to be crazy. The traffic is crazy getting over the bridge to Southern. And I expect this game to be a good game. I think the people are going to get a good show. Um, if you watch the Southern Preview game from 2019, I think this game is going to be a lot like that game. Um, defensively, both, team, both teams are going to bend and not break, really. Um, it's going to come down to who gets the last stop. And I like both teams, and I can honestly see a scenario where both teams win this game, but obviously that cannot happen. Um, this is a huge game. I, I don't think Prairie View is unbeatable, so that helps Southern in this regard, but Southern is an enigma. Um, they played their best game Saturday, but they still had a lot of mistakes on special teams. Um, but they've been improving, and they realize that they can't lose anymore. I think with their back against the wall, they're going to play with an edge, but Prairie View brings an edge because Coach Dooley always has his guys ready to go, especially when they play Southern. So, I'm expecting a, a really good game. Um, Six o'clock, ESPN Plus broadcast, homecoming, great crowd, um, fans, you name it, atmosphere, game's going to match all of that. I got Southern 34-31. Um, I could easily see that score being reversed. I don't really think that this game is going to be a blowout, but if it do, I would, I would lean more on Prairie View if this game got out of hand, but I'm going 34-31 Southern um, in a very tight game that's going to come down to the fourth quarter, late in the fourth quarter. And um, I'm I'm really eager to see this game, and I'm eager to see this week eight action. So that's going to do it for me. I'm about to get on up out of here, man. Y'all enjoy. Y'all hump day. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow with a live edition of Swag Smoke, 6 o'clock Central, 7 o'clock Eastern. Sunday, week eight recap. Um, if you're going to a game, man, please be safe, man. It's been wild on these campuses the last this last week. Um, please be please be safe, man. You know, don't don't a lot of these people cause problems are not alums or students. So man, just be careful of anybody you see around campus. Um, and then enjoy yourself, man. If you're coming down to the yard for homecoming, I'll be in lot E. Oh, uh, that's by Seymour Gymnasium. I, I sit in the north, the north end zone. So, um, if you see me, man, holler. I, I'll be glad to holler at everybody, man. So, with that being said, I'm Steve Wells, your Swag Tour Guide. I'm signing out, and y'all enjoy y'all day. <laughs>